Well, good morning, folks. We went from a sound system that wasn't working to one that's working really well. Um, it's really good uh, to see you all again this morning. Such a beautiful morning to come out and to meet and to worship God together. You're all uh, very welcome, and those visiting with us, it's really good uh, to have you with us too. Uh, we trust that you feel something of, of our family. Uh, the, the sense of God's family as we meet here together and we will know God's blessing uh, as we meet together. It's, so it's really good uh, to be able to meet together uh, and hopefully uh, as the weeks go on uh, our numbers will continue uh, to grow uh, even with the social distancing. I know it seems very strange uh, as we meet but it's really good uh, to be able to come and to join uh, together and to have that sense of fellowship together. So. If you are speaking to people during the week, please encourage them uh, to begin uh, to come along. Especially now uh, things are moving on and, and the shielding has been paused. Uh, I've been reminded this week to, to remind people that shielding is paused, it's not over, it's only on pause. Uh, but we trust that we will never go back uh, to where it was before. But it's good to join with you uh, in worship this morning. Just a few announcements can just remi remind uh, members of Kirk Session that we're meeting this Wednesday evening. Uh, at 7.30, just a few things uh, we want to, to discuss and to keep up to date with things uh, as well, keep an eye on things as, as we go along. Uh, so that obviously means, as I said last week, uh, our midweek individual prayer uh, is finished for the month of August. Um, but please continue uh, to remember uh, the situation that, that we're in uh, and of course our fellowship and prayer has been good uh, to come together. But now we're meeting on a Sunday. Uh, it kind of negates that a little bit, but continue uh, to pray. We always take a break over the summer, uh, so this is our, our summer break uh, as such. Don't forget this evening as well, 7pm, is the drive-in service at the Park and Ride in Drumahoe. If you're free uh, at that time, I know you'd be made more than welcome there. Uh, this Sunday evening is Ernie and Yvonne Stewart. Uh, when life falls apart, where do I turn? Uh, so I encourage you, if you're free, to go along. Uh, to that. Also, the word for today, uh, our, our little daily devotional books uh, are available. Then they're in uh, at the door of the hall there on your way out. If you normally take one, uh, please lift one. If you know someone who's not here who normally gets one, uh, could you lift it and take it to them? If you don't normally take one, take one. I encourage you. Uh, we just said uh, the title for tonight is Where Do We Turn To When Life falls apart and God's word is a good place to turn to, isn't it? Uh, so those are wonderful means to, to help us and to guide us in that. So please make use of them. As an encouragement, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen online already, uh, our pound jar was counted for the month and the little um, shrapnel scrap jars that we've been collecting uh, to raise funds for uh, our building project uh, have been counted and to date. Uh, the pound jar, uh, we have uh, collected £2,076, so really one well done and thank you to all who have contributed to that and it is obviously a great need we have, uh, so please continue to do that and if you can think of any other ways of, of raising money, that would be good uh, as well. Uh, as you know, lots of the fundraising things that we had planned uh, have had to be put on hold because of the COVID and the pandemic. So. If you can think of ideas, uh, we're more than, than open uh, to those. The little shrapnel jars as well, so as £424. It's quite a lot of money and two piece and one piece and so on. Uh, so again, thank you. Nearly £2,500 just in those little collections. So keep doing uh, what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good thing uh, to be doing. Last announcement is an announcement with some sadness. Of course, some uh, will know uh, as with sadness we announced the passing of one of our, our members here of this fellowship. Uh, Greta Matthews passed away last Sunday afternoon. And her funeral service was on Wednesday past, uh, and in line obviously with uh, COVID uh, restrictions. So please pray for her family, for her daughter Karen and her husband Jim, her grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, it's a difficult time, uh, but all compounded, of course, by the restrictions and, and so on on our funeral services uh, at the moment. In fact, let's just do, uh, as we always do, let's just commit them uh, to prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Commit them in prayer to God now. Let's, let's pray together. 
Father, as we just uh, mentioned, it is with sadness uh, that we uh, mark the passing of one of our fellowship. And Lord, as we recognise there as well, uh, when this happens during these COVID restrictions, it makes things even more difficult. Lord, we can't have friends and so on around to help us to grieve, and the grieving process is so much harder. And Father, we thank you uh, for Greta, for her life, and we thank you for her family, and Lord, we pray for them today. Lord, that you would give them the strength uh, and the comfort that they need in the days ahead. Lord, help them to grieve, even though it is even more difficult. Lord, help them to come to terms uh, with this. And Lord, in all things, Lord, help them to turn to you, that you might bring that comfort that they so need at this time. Lord, we commit them to you and ask for your blessing on them in these days that lie ahead. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we come uh, to, to worship, uh, I want to read a few verses uh, just from Psalm uh, 34. Uh, we're going to, to sing our opening praise based on this psalm, uh, and it focuses uh, on a few verses. But let me read them uh, to you. Psalm 34, the psalmist says this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my lips. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name uh, together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. We're going to echo those words in our opening praise uh, through all the changing scenes of life and trouble and in joy. It's back to the same thing we've been talking about. Turning to God when life is difficult. God is there for us as the great sovereign God we come uh, to worship. Uh, so let's stand together and let's sing our opening praise together through all the changing scenes in life. Let's worship God together.
just still ourselves and come to God in prayer. Let's commit our time of worship to him uh, together. Let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Through all those changing scenes in life and trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. Our Father, as those words of our mouth fade and we come and we still ourselves and take this moment to bow to you in prayer, surely it does amaze us that we lowly sinners could even dare to come into the presence of the almighty, sovereign and gracious God. And Father, we do buy and worship because we know that we're offering our, our worship and indeed ourselves to the one that in your amazing love left your throne with all its glory and majesty and humbled yourself to come down and walk amongst us. And then you died for us so that we might experience that amazing grace and forgiveness in our lives. <coughs> Lord, surely that drives our hearts to praise and to worship you in all aspects of our lives. Father, we marvel at your boundless love towards us. Us, your frail children. Children who are in constant need of your healing and of your grace. Each and every day as we strive to live our lives for you. In this our time and in our world. And Father, we recognise how often we, we seem to fear you, we fall short of how we know we should act and behave towards each other. We seem to be so easily distracted from you, or so easily distracted and tempted to simply behave no different from the world around us. Yet we know that as your children, as your family, you've called us to be different. You've called us to treat each other in a manner which stands out from the world and it stands against the ways of the world. And so as we, as we look at ourselves, we can often feel so unworthy to come and to, to speak with you in prayer, to worship you, to praise you here yet. And Father, in your power and in your grace, you accept us and you continually forgive us. You've provided that path for us to come to you through the life, the death and the resurrection of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus. You've given us the power of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives to help guide us and direct us in your ways. So we pray today, Father, as we come to worship you this morning, that you would remind us of that wonderful grace. As the hymn says, that wonderful grace that gives us what we don't deserve. Lord, we pray that in your power you'd move amongst us. You'd minister that grace to us that we might, well as the psalmist put it, might taste and see that you, the Lord, are good. We pray that you'd inspire this time of praise and worship that we might declare to the world the wonders of your might and of your care made available to all who come as we should in honest and heartfelt faith and trust in the name of our Saviour and Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to God's word. That's together now. We're going to turn to our reading. Lost my order of service somewhere along the way. I want to turn to our reading. You shouldn't need it anyway. We're continuing through our series. And uh, no, I've got it, Mark. Thank you. Um, we're continuing in our series through uh, the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount. And we're going to read uh, that together now. It should come up on your screens if you have a Bible uh, in your hands. If you open it up to, to Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we'll read again from verse 1. If you're at home, it would be good if you uh, can bring uh, your Bible out because uh, it's on the screen here. This is God's word. Let's read it uh, together. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We end our reading there today at verse 12, and we trust that God uh, will speak to us through his word. We thank him for it uh, and trust uh, that he will, yes, indeed bless us as we turn to it uh, later on. I want to speak for a minute to the children, those who are amongst us here, and those who are watching maybe on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, we know many folk join us week by week on YouTube and on Facebook and so on, so it's good uh, to take these few moments uh, to speak to them. And, well, I brought my little bag with me uh, today. It's kind of hard for me to show it uh, to the camera. My, my little Toy Story bag. It's been a while since it has been brought here, but uh, you can see I have something with me in, in the bag. Uh, I've seen a few worried looks when I came in the door with it there, but I uh, brought my baseball bat with me. Uh, always a useful thing to have, isn't it? Useful, of course, to play baseball with, or as, well, I'm sure many here, and as I did when we were younger, it was rounders. It wasn't called baseball, it was called rounders, but I guess it's the same kind of game, isn't it? And we have our bat, and we have our ball. You ready to catch it, George? You think that I, think that I had it down to him? See, I have not work. I not work. I'm trying to fill you there. But... Oh, look at that there. Oh, I'll not hit the real one. You're all right. That's me out, isn't it? Right, David, you must have you when I pick up and finish the talk here because I'm out. Why did I bring the baseball bat with me? Well, I'm sure that the children listening uh, will remember uh, we have talked about uh, our friend little Johnny uh, once or twice before uh, and it's little Johnny I want to think about today because little Johnny had his baseball bat and ball as well and, and little Johnny really enjoyed uh, playing rounders up with his friends out in, in the street. Of course he goes out one day. Do you want a ball Catherine? Johnny went out into the street with, with his friends one day uh, to play uh, around us and of course you probably know where I'm going here because I'm sure some of us have done it before uh, but they're out in the middle of the street uh, and they're uh, playing the rounders and, and Johnny stands up and he hits them all as, as hard as he could and up into the air he goes and flies over over the top of the fence and where does it go? Through a window, through a window, and it goes through the window of his next door neighbor's house. Shock and horror, terrible, terrible. What was Johnny going to do? Johnny goes to the neighbor's house and thinks, How am I going to ask for my bowl? I can put the window. And I'll be skulk, is that a word down there? Skulk, I'll be skulk up the path to the next door neighbor's house and says, I'm sorry, Mrs. Can I have my ball back, please? Waiting, of course, to be told that they were he's going to have to pay for the damage and they were going to tell his mommy and daddy on him and so on. But of course, that wasn't what happened. The lady in the house says, Johnny, it's all right. Accidents happen. Don't worry about it. Here's your ball. Away you go. Johnny was shocked, couldn't believe that somebody would forgive him like that. But that's 
the sort of attitude uh, that Jesus calls us to have. That forgiving attitude, forgiving people who have wronged us. And we're called to have that attitude because that's how God treated us. Whether we're young, whether we're older, we all do wrong things, don't we? And yet God doesn't hold it against us. God forgives us. And if we really grasp how much God loves us and forgives us, then we can do nothing else but be forgiving to others. It's never easy, sure it's not. If you were that lady or, or man in the house and the ball comes through your window, you would be angry, wouldn't you? But we're called to be forgiving. Let me pray. Let me pray with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are that forgiving God. We've already mentioned it, Father. We thank you that you forgive us. You forgive us all the sins of our past and all the sins that we will commit in the future. Father, yes, when we really grasp that, but what else could we do but forgive others? Yes, we know how difficult that can be in the, the real world. And Father, we pray that you would help each of us to do just that. Forgive others as you have forgiven us. So will you help us? You guide us in these days. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing uh, the children's song together now. It's going to be up on the screens. God loves you and I love you. And that's the way it should be. Uh, let's all stand together and let's sing. again for your love for us and love that has opened up this way for us through Jesus to come and to talk to you in prayer Father we, th we thank you that well, you want us to come you want us to open up our hearts and, 
our very souls to you and to, to come that you might help us. That you might help us to carry the burden of life. We thank you that when that burden can seem so heavy sometimes, that you are always there for us. We want to pray today for all who are burdened in, in any way. Father, we all experience so many different troubles and trials in life. Those physical burdens through illness, those emotional burdens, and indeed the spiritual burdens, the trials in life. We do, we want to pray for them all, but we want to pray specifically for those who are, are burdened with sin today. We want to pray that they would know the, the real healing power of your grace and mercy shown to us through the, the sacrifice of Jesus for their sins. Father, we, we pray that you would, would burden each of us to pray continually for those we know who need to experience that mercy and salvation. Father, we all have those in our families and our circles of friends who, Lord, we know need to know that relationship with you in these days. Father, we know life has been difficult for, for so many. Lord, we pray that each would come to know you as their, as their father, as their helper, as the one, yes, that they can turn to when life is tough. And Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your, your mercy, your grace, and your provision for us. And Lord, we thank you that we can indeed come together here. We're so thankful that we can come and to worship you. And Lord, we pray that you would speak into the lives, that you would speak into the hearts of others in this fellowship, Lord, that you might draw them to join with us and to worship here. To take up this wonderful opportunity to meet in fellowship with each other and with you, to sing of our praise, of your praise. And Father, we, we thank you for those who lead us in that worship. Lord, we pray for Marcus, he takes some time away. Lord, we thank you for Catherine standing in. Lord, we thank you for all those who lead us in our singing here. Lord, we look forward to that day when all of us can be on this stage to lead and to sing of your goodness and of your grace. Father, I want to pray for our families here today. Lord, we give thanks for your protection of so much of our family lives during the lockdown. Lord, we pray that you would continue to enable us, all of our family, to thrive in our relationships, Lord, which, yes, may indeed even have been strained during this lockdown. So we pray for families who have particularly felt the strain of the past few months. Lord, we pray and ask that you would restore your peace, your calm, and the situations of, of stress and strain. We pray a prayer of new appreciation of silence. We pray in this moment. Lord of softly spoken truth, we hear the volume of life steadily rising. It's all getting so noisy once again. In lockdown, everything seemed so much quieter. No planes, less traffic, fewer crowds, more tranquility. In lockdown helped us to learn to, to listen, perhaps as never before. Truly was a time to be silent, to hear creation voice its praise of you, to hear one another in a, a deeper and more meaningful way, to hear the, 
the inner voice of our souls. Thank you, Father, for reminding us that you can be found in the silence. And that we often fail to sense you present amid the, the daily hubbub of busy life. Thank you for the uncomfortable sense of conviction that silence evoked. How often we sin in words casually thought and carelessly uttered, all adding to the clamour of godless inner and outer chatter. Thank you for the silent moments of deeper appreciation of all your gifts, calling forth fresh thanks and praise, fuller adoration and gratitude. And as the racket of life ramps up once more, help us to carefully recall and retain the silent awe of just being in your company. The silent response as your spirit brings home your word to our hearts. A silent heart of prayerful reflection. A silent moment to remember you before we go into an eventful day. And the silent, unspoken love given and received and just being with someone special. Hear these, our prayers. Softly spoken, deeply felt, gently offered, greatly sought from the one who hears even our inward groans as we wait for the full unfolding of future hope in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and worship God once again through song. Our next piece of praise as we stand is love with an everlasting love led by grace and that love to know. Now let's stand and let's worship God together.
long time since I sung that hymn, and although the hymn book doesn't repeat the last two lines, of course, the tune lends uh, to, to repeating those, but we got there, we got there. Um, I want to turn to uh, our talk for now, uh, and we turn, as we say, back to the, uh, the Beatitudes again, and we move on uh, to our next one. But I think as we've worked our way through these Beatitudes uh, so far, that there's no doubt uh, that Jesus uh, is presenting us with some real challenges. Uh, I just want to think back through some of them. Of course, the first challenge was uh, about the genuineness of our profession of faith, uh, if we're claiming to be his disciples and followers. Uh, which is why he lays out what's at the heart of the gospel uh, and, of course, repentance in those first three Beatitudes. And then it should be fairly clear that there are uh, particular changes that Jesus expects uh, from those who have already taken those, or have really taken those first Beatitudes to heart. Uh, we noticed how the first four Beatitudes uh, occur in a very intentional order, how the, the one we looked at last week was the pivotal one or the turning point as such uh, in the outworking of the inward reality of, of the first three. It's logical uh, and obvious then that if we fulfil those first four Abbey attitudes, that we would and should expect a change to happen in, in our characters. So now Jesus begins to build this picture of what this a transformed character is, is supposed to look like in someone who has been touched uh, by God's Spirit. And of course, it's being progressively changed and remade in Christ's image. It's clear throughout Scripture that uh, there's, there's a call for those who claim to be disciples of Jesus to be different. We've hinted at it already through your service. I know it's something that comes up quite often in our talks, but it's something which comes up even more regularly in Scripture. We are to be different, we are to live different. And we are to think different than the world around us. Yes, we are in the world, but not of the world. We are Christians in the world, but not worldly Christians. Who we are and what we believe has to have an outward expression in our actions and our interactions with others. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Isn't that, isn't that what scripture says? The old has gone and the new has come. When Paul was writing to the church in Rome, he had a lot to say about doctrine and beliefs and the like in that book. The book of Romans it is widely accepted as the most explicit book about Christian doctrine in the New Testament. And yet to Paul, all that doctrine has a purpose. Those beliefs, what, we're, what we believe is supposed to change us and to help us live a holy life through the power of Christ living within us. That's the purpose. The power of Christ living within us. And that's an important point. The change comes from the power of Christ within us. We can't save ourselves, we know that. And we can't change ourselves either. It's only by the power of Christ. As a bit of an aside to that, I've been watching a great programme on Netflix. If you have it, I would highly recommend you, you, you flick over to this programme. Now it's fairly lengthy. I'm not even fully through it myself. It's two hours, 20 minutes long. So if you've got a free night, there's your view for you. I'm watching it in little sections. But it's really worth it. There's some great teaching uh, from men like Brian Chappell, who was president of Covenant a Theological Seminary that has strong links with us here in PCI. There are others from Westminster Seminary that's linked closely with us as well. But the program begins by, by laying out the heart of the gospel. That's why I bring it to you today. It lays out the heart of the gospel and the work of the gospel in our hearts and how that flows out into our lives. But what's also useful about it, it moves on to expose the fallacy of the false gospel. A popular notion that teaches us that we can save ourselves and that we can change ourselves. The danger of that false teaching of those within, well, what they refer to as then the health and wealth or, or prosperity gospel movement, who in truth uh, are only 
disguising themselves as Christians. It's called American Gospel, Christ alone. So if you can remember that, Christ, American Gospel, Christ alone. But don't be fooled, friends, into thinking that it's just about America. It's focused on there because that's where it is most right. But there are plenty of folk and recent church movements, even in this country, even in this wee province, that are being fooled by the same thing. Satan makes us believe, yes, that we can save ourselves and we can change ourselves, but it is only the power of Christ that can change us. It's only the power of Christ that can save us. So back to Paul and Romans for a second. The book of Romans, after 11 lengthy chapters of doctrine, Paul reminds them, and of course us, that everything he has said in those 11 chapters should have an effect on us. It should have an outwork. And he gives us that wonderful passage that shows what effect the things that we know should have on us. It's more about, it's more than just about knowledge, Paul says. Even though I've taught you all those things, it's about what you do in light of what God has done for you. Therefore, because God has saved us, Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In view of God's mercy to you, Paul says we are to live holy and pleasing lives to God. In other words, we are to be transformed into what pleases God. What we believe must affect the way we behave. And so the first character adjustment that Jesus calls for in these Beatitudes is that we are to be merciful. First and foremost, God shows his mercy and grace to us. And so we are to be merciful and gracious. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. One of the, the primary characteristics we are called to have is that same attitude of showing mercy and graciousness towards others. It's about showing mercy and forgiveness to others because God has shown his mercy and forgiveness to us. Let me tell you a little story uh, about a man and I hope I've given his name right here. Kim Jung Gun. My Chinese or Korean isn't that good. Uh, but Kim lived on Shinam Island around the time of the Korean War. Uh, and he had seen about 2,000 of the 20,000 people who lived on that island murdered by the occupying communists. And one day they came to his house and they dragged him and his family outside, outside the village where Kim's father and his wife were beaten to death. Kim himself was beaten and left for dead. When he revived a bit, he sought safety in what he thought was a friend's house. But they turned him over to the communists again, and he was dragged away to be beaten again. And the sudden appearance of an American ship off the island's coast saved him as such, because the communist soldiers all hurried away to fight against the Americans who had begun to land on the island. Kim went and hid out in the countryside until the South Korean army and the Americans had recaptured the island. And the communists who had killed his wife and his father were arrested. And because it was wartime, the local police chief had the authority to execute those men without trial. But as the police chief prepared to kill the men, Kim pleaded with them to spare their lives. And the police chief was obviously surprised. He says, they, they killed your family and almost beat you to death. Why do you now want to spare their lives? This is what Kim says. Because the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve, would have me show mercy to them. Extraordinary. Those communists were spared execution because of Kim's plea. plea. Because the Lord, which I am and whom I serve, would have me show mercy to them. 
news of what he had done spread among other communist supporters in the area and then came later went into the mountains to preach to some communists who were hiding there. Well, he wasn't killed. In fact, many of the communists became Christians. And when Kim eventually left the island, there was a flourishing church with 108 members. His faith and belief in Jesus made a huge difference in his life, didn't it? Now, none of us will hopefully ever be faced with having to make such a serious choice like Kim did. But isn't that a wonderful example of a a true change of heart in someone who has come to faith in Jesus. Where that faith is working itself out in their outward actions and, and, and attitudes. It's a wonderful example of showing mercy and forgiveness to others who have seriously wronged us. And all because God has shown his mercy and forgiveness to us in the first place. It's the natural flow of mercy that God expects from us, isn't it? And I know that might seem hard sometimes. It is hard to forgive sometimes, isn't it? But interestingly, a guy called James Montgomery Boyce, who I would read a lot of, he was senior pastor in the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, says that if we don't show mercy to others, we show that either we don't really understand the mercy that saved us, or we've never actually received it in the first place. We either don't understand the mercy that saved us or we've never actually received it. Friends, of course it's a challenge. Forgiveness and forgiving others is always going to be a challenge, but that's what Jesus expects of us and he's testing us as such. He was testing his disciples as such, testing them about the depth of their profession of faith and yes, the outworking of that profession. By their fruit, you will know they are my disciples. Isn't that what he says? Specifically here, he's challenging that characteristic of being able to forgive and to show mercy and compassion to others. I know it's not easy sometimes. When we think about forgiveness and showing mercy and so on, the problem is that when we've been hurt or wronged, well, being merciful and forgiving isn't the first thing that comes to our minds, here, is not it? We certainly know all too well about past hurts in this province. And all I can say is that we all struggle with it. Each and every one of us struggle with it, and quite a lot of the time, to do. forgiveness isn't easy sometimes. Our natural reaction is to get back at those who have hurt us. So yes, we often bury the hatchet as the saying goes. Then we like to leave the handle sticking out so we can pick it up again and use it at some other stage. So often it's true, like they say, hurt people, hurt. We story told about a man who went to the doctor uh, and the doctor told him uh, that he had rabies. The man immediately reached down and took a piece of paper and a pen and began to write frantically on the piece of paper. The doctor thought he was writing as well and so I said to him, oh, wait a minute. Said, you don't need to write your will. You're not going to die. The man replied, he says, Doctor, I'm not writing my will. He says, I'm making a list of people I want to go and bite. It's funny, isn't it? But the, tr the truth is, could that analogy be so true of any of us? We want revenge rather than be forgiving. Forgiveness isn't easy. But look at Jesus. Isn't he the ultimate example of mercy and forgiveness? Just think about him for a minute. Yes, of course, there's story after story of his compassion and forgiveness and mercy throughout Scripture, throughout the Gospels. But what about the final act in his earthly story, if we could call it that? Look at him on the cross. A man who never sinned, a man who never did any harm to anyone, a man who simply came to preach the truth of God and to seek and to save the lost. There he is, nailed and suffering the agony of that cross. And yet what is it he says as he looks at the people responsible for him? Father, forgive them. 
forgive them. And you and I are supposed to become like that. Wow. Yes. Of course, we know we will all fail the test, won't we? We'll all fall well short. We're, we're sinners after all. That's why it's important to see these Beatitudes as a whole, with each one building on the other ones. It's like we've said, we can do it on our own. Think of the flow of these Beatitudes again. We can do this on our own. We can become merciful on our own. It's only by truly coming to faith as Jesus describes it in the first half of the Beatitudes and seeking the empowerment we get through the filling of the Holy Spirit that he described in that pivotal one we looked at last week, that we can have this power of the Holy Spirit to help us day by day. It's only with the, the Spirit's help that we grow more and more like Jesus each and every day. It's only with the Spirit's help that we can face up to the challenge of being truly changed. It's only with the Spirit's help that our characters are changed. Changed into the character of a true disciple and follower of Jesus. Do you know the power of that Spirit in your life, friend? <clears throat> what does the Lord require of you? Asked Micah. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus says, for they shall receive mercy. Friend, as you experience God's mercy and forgiveness in your own life, that mercy should flow freely. No, it should overflow freely to those around you. Are you growing in character? Are you growing more like Jesus each and every day? <clears throat> it's not easy. But we can ask God's Spirit to help us. What a wonderful blessing that is. Blessed by the merciful. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy in each of our lives. Father, we thank you that you first loved us, that you forgive us. So Father, will you help us? By the power of your Spirit, will you fill us that we might be changed, that we might be transformed, and that that mercy and forgiveness might overflow from us. Lord, help us to be that living example of Jesus in our world today. Lord, help us to point others to Jesus, that they might know that forgiveness in their own life. Lord, will you bless us, those who have received mercy, that we might show that mercy to others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close our service with our last hymn. And together we're going to stand and we're going to sing of God's grace. God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible in feel, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
as we always do with our God of love and light prayer. And then I'll close with the words of the benediction together. Let's, let's pray together. Let's say this prayer uh, together. God of love and light, in this time of fear, give us your peace. In this time of isolation, give us your presence. In this time of sickness, give us your healing. In this time of uncertainty, give us your wisdom. In this time of darkness, shine your light upon us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would go with each of us now and forevermore.